Are you looking for a space where you will learn to improve your mental strength, emotional health, and heal your insecurities from the inside out? Take the first step to living a more meaningful life with the Better Me with Body by Brie podcast. I'm your host, Brie. I'm a certified personal trainer, entrepreneur, and mother of three. I've helped empower thousands of women to take action through fitness, nutrition, meditation, personal development, and aligning thoughts with action. This podcast is for those who are ready to feel inspired and motivated to live a more purposeful life. Let's grow together. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast today. We have a very special guest, and I'm kind of fangirling over here because I'm obsessed with her and everything she stands for, and her podcasts are amazing. So we are actually doing a a relationship and sexual coach therapy session with my husband, Adam. I'm so ready for this. (laughs) (laughs) And we have Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife here with us, and I'm going to introduce her and kind of tell a little bit about her background and what she does. So she teaches LDS couples and individuals how to strengthen their relationships, overcome relational and sexual roadblocks, and increase their capacity for intimacy, love, and sexual expression. So Jennifer, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Do you want to introduce a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. So um, let's see. I live in Chicago with my husband. I have three children. And um, I, um, I'm trying to think, I grew up in the state of Vermont. I studied, got my degrees in psychology and women's studies, and then went on and got a PhD in counseling psychology. And I wrote my dissertation on LDS women and sexual agency. And that's, you know, I was always very interested in couples work um, from a young age. I just um, I think in some ways had idealism around couplehood and also saw a lot of unhappy couples. And so I, uh, just cared about how people could create happier relationships. And then with my dissertation work and clinical work, I started really wanting to help couples have happier and more solid sexual relationships as well, because it's so integral to a happy marriage, at least in our modern era. So um, so that yes. work I do, I do a lot of online teaching. I, I do online courses so that I don't kind of keep repeating some of these core concepts, but give people a, a way to kind of think about their own marriages and their own participation in a unhappy marriage or a less intimate marriage and give people through the online teaching I do either in my courses or through the podcast that I do. Uh, just tools for uh, <clears throat> understanding themselves better, being able to improve kind of the most important relationship in your life. So, Definitely. Yeah. And all of your podcasts that I've listened to, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was life changing. Every single one. You have so much wisdom. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to share it. And Adam was excited because you went to Boston College. Hey, <laughs> I didn't know you were a fellow New Englander. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so Adam, where are you from? And were you? Uh, So I I grew up just outside Boston. So uh, yeah, I didn't know you were from Vermont, though. I am. And I'm actually sitting in Vermont right now. So get out. Okay, We're so jealous. It's very (laughs) hot here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we I actually wanted to do something a little different. I thought it would be fun. I did ask all of my followers um, on my Instagram, hey, I'm going to be doing this interview with Jennifer and I want to make sure that we talk about topics that you guys have. So they all asked a bunch of questions, um, but it was kind of a lot of the same stuff that everybody deals with. So we thought it'd be fun if we did kind of like a session with you Mm -hmm. and we talk about issues that most couples have and you can kind of counsel us. Are you ready? (laughs) I I will. I will treat it like a cold call in the sense that it kind of is. So we'll we'll see where it goes. Awesome. I'm so excited. By the way, when Bree told me she wanted to do this, I was so nervous that my mom was going to listen to this podcast. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) It's okay. Everybody has sex. It's fine. Um, So I'm way more candid. I'm way more candid and open than Adam is. So we'll Uh see how this goes. This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. So a little background about us um, is that we've been married for eight years and we have three children under the age of six. So Mm -hmm. we are in the thick of parenting. I have a one-year-old 
And I would say that my first question would be, well, when I was thinking about the theme of this podcast and kind of what I wanted to cover, I knew that I wanted to make sure that we talk about how to build stronger intimate connection with our spouse so mm-hmm. that we can have confidence in our sexuality. Mm-hmm. So I knew I kind of wanted to talk about that. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that, like, I mean, I would consider myself a very sexual person and so mm-hmm. would Adam, right? Like we both joke about it. I'm like, I don't know why. I'm, I'm just, I've always been a very sexual person mm-hmm. my whole life. But then I had kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then especially after my third, it's kind of, I mean, I just feel like my libido just plummeted, which is sad because I miss it. I love having a high libido and it's just not what it used to be. So yeah. I guess my question would be like. We call it, so that's what I call the bait and switch. Oh, geez. <laughs> So I guess, I guess my question would be like, how do you, like, what are your thoughts if like one partner's libido is so much higher than the other person? Well, I would say welcome to marriage. (laughs) Right. I know Um, there's always going to be like an imbalance. Well, there's often an imbalance that's a little bit of a false imbalance. That is to say that, that each person in the couple kind of plays out a different part of a dynamic or that's is to say the ambivalence around sexuality and intimacy often gets played out through each partner taking on a different position but it doesn't it it often it often obscures the ambivalence in both partners or it obscures the desires of both partners because it gets played out in a high low desire frame but since you want me to treat this a little bit like a coaching session, let me just kind of ask you if I were to be perfectly helpful to you, like if I were to give you what would help you the most in this hour, you know, what would you each say would like, Adam, do you have a, I have a sense of what you're wanting, Brianna. Uh, but maybe you could each say, say what you think would help you most, what you're looking for clarity on. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, right, you're in the dating scene and, um, you both had, I mean, we both were, um, you know, I would say had high sex drives and then obviously Mm -hmm. we get married and and the first year was good. And then, uh, and then the kids come along. So it's kind of at this point, it's a, it's, it's kind of, uh, and obviously this is like you said, everybody deals with this, but for me, it's like, okay, but how do I, um, how do I negotiate the terms of, okay, Hey Brie, like I would like to have sex this amount of time and, but then keep, keep the intimacy. And at the same time, I mean, this is from my perspective Mm -hmm. is um, it's like, Hey honey, I only need like 10 minutes a day. Right. (laughs) Like I'm not, I don't need a whole lot of time. And, and Brie's really good about that for the most part, but I do have a good portion of my friends that we do talk and Mm -hmm. it's kind of, um, it's difficult because they're from a guy's perspective, we're just like, look, you, you know, you're on, you have your kids, but then you spend maybe an hour on Instagram. And it, from mm-hmm. our perspective, we're like, look, we're only asking for 10 minutes. That's it. Like mm-hmm. we're not asking for a lot. So from, from my side, it's kind of like, okay, there's a little bit of resentment in that sense from, from the male side. And, and once yeah. again, Brie has been good, but then at the other side of it is, well, I don't want to make her feel used. And, yeah. and then obviously I, then there's resentment from, from the other side, which is Bree's side, which, you know, sure. I'll let her, I'll let her cover that. But so I think that's kind of from the male perspective of is, Hey, you know, I'm doing a lot. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help as much as I can. I'm not yeah. asking for a lot. Um, yeah. and, and that's kind of, and, and I've listened to some of the other podcasts, but what I notice is this under undertone of, of resentment that kind of starts to build. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, well, um, if I'm trying to negotiate and say, Hey, I, I, I'd like to have sex four times a week. Uh, how do you, how, how do you negotiate that and make terms, but then have it still feel, uh, romantic and right. intimate. Right. So you're, 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 um, basically sticking your thumb right into the center of your dilemma. Yeah. Cause I'll just say this before I get Brianna's view of what would be helpful. You are relating to this with your guy friends as if a wife is a need fulfiller. And Mm -hmm. all you need is 10 minutes to be serviced. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's a meaning frame. That's not about intimacy. That's about need fulfillment. 
and yeah. she's got the key to give you the sexual gratification that you need or want. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not an act of intimacy then. Um, it's not about being with. And so as soon as a partner thinks I'm here to manage his or her needs, um, that they, they see me as somebody who's got a job to do for them to manage their sense of self or their sense of well being, it immediately puts it into a use frame that makes it difficult to want. So unwittingly, I mean, men are taught this frame. So are women. Okay. So you're very normal, Adam, in that you're speaking to the frame that many, many people are living within because it's the one they were taught, but it's a frame that precludes intimacy and drives resentment. So it's like the more you do it, I mean, it's a tempting frame to be in, but it actually keeps you from getting what you want. Mm Mm-hmm. The intimacy frame is more about um, you're not responsible for my sense of self, but I want to be with you. I want to share a life with you. I want to share sexuality with you. I want to have a romantic, intimate friendship with you. You know, I only need 10 minutes is a different meaning frame. It's not about partnership and sharing. It's about servicing. So I'll, are, I'll, I'll help. He's you. really nodding over here. Oh, really? like a big <laughs> smile. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, good. So I'll come back to some of that, but Bree, maybe say like, what are, start with what you're acknowledging. There's two different questions I want to hear from you. Like, what are you agreeing with and what I'm saying or what resonates with you? But I don't want to lose track of the question of if I were to be perfectly helpful, if you would articulate what that would be. Yeah, I would, I mean, so my, it's, it's this exact, it's exactly what you said. Like I told Adam, like, I mean, there are times when I, I love when I am really in it and I'm turned on and it's so fun and we're really connecting and I love that. Mm-hmm. But I do get resentful if he's like, Hey, I just need 10 minutes. Then I'm like, Oh, then I feel used. And yeah, so that's me. Right. It's not about me. No, Mm -hmm. it's not about me. But sometimes I told Adam, like, what has helped us a lot in our marriage, though, is I tell Adam, like, hey, but then it does take away the romance part of it. But I'm like, you know what? If, like, when you are really helpful around the house or, like, you're texting me during the day, like, hey, how was your day, sweetie? I love you. Or you come up and put your hand on my back and you're kissing me, like, that makes me feel connected to you. So then when you at night, even if I'm tired and maybe I'm not like really turned on in the moment, I'm way more willing to be like, yeah, let's do it. Just because I feel like he took care of me that day, you know? So then I'm okay. Then I don't feel resentful or used because I'm like, you made me a priority today. I can make you a priority, you know? And then I'm always happy after. It's just really like, you know, getting going. That's the hard part, but that Mm -hmm. is a total, you hit the nail on the head. Like the, it's kind of like how it's approached. And, and my whole thing is like, I just don't want to feel resentful or feel used if I do it when I don't want to do it, you know? And I, I appreciate, so I'm just going to give a couple comments to what you just said. I appreciate what you're saying, which is if I feel attended to, I feel cared about, um, then I feel more open. And, 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 um, I think you're grappling with two different meaning frames there also. So I just going to articulate them. Okay. You're using the language just at the end there. That's more transactional, which is you put me first or you accommodated my needs, which was to be attended to have the dishes helped. So I will attend to your needs. Yeah. That's more of a transactional frame. Okay. So it's not the, how to say it. It's not the end of the world. (laughs) But it is, it's not a frame of intimacy. It's a frame of mutual need fulfillment. Um, A more intimate meaning frame, which I think is there, you're sort of toying with it as you're kind of uh, grappling with both of these meanings. One is like, I don't want to feel that sex is about you just getting your needs met. I want to feel like you want to be with me. Yes. That you care about me. That doing the dishes is about is this an exp- reaching out in the middle of the day is not so that you'll get some tonight. It's because you care about me. Yes, exactly. Right. And so yes. it's not about, hey, do these four things, then I'll be willing. I mean, people do their marriages like that. Right. But I think 
what most of us really want is a sense uh, and that we really are cared about. And I think women are kind of taught the idea that men's sexuality is indiscriminate. And there's some basis for that, because I think from a psychobiological point of view, men are less vulnerable when they're sexual from a purely biological sense. They're not going to get pregnant. They're not as likely to get a disease. Women to open their bodies up is a much more vulnerable position in the sense that you could get a disease more easily, you could get pregnant. So women, I think, have um, been wired up through time to be picky about whom they're sexual with. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense to be picky. But I think because you are vulnerable when you reproduce, you want to know that the person that you're opening up to sexually has your back that they yeah. care about you, that they're not just in it for the orgasm or the sex. They're, that they, they don't just want to have sex. They want to have sex with you. Right. They want to be with you. And so, you know, a lot of times we, we as women can use the language of I need this or I need to feel psychologically intimate and so on. Um, and therefore I will now be sexually intimate. But I think a better framing is that... I want, you know, this is what I think. I think a lot of people really do want intimate marriages. They right. want at least ideally the sense that we are really friends and we can share ourselves with one another sexually, emotionally, that we can really enjoy together these adventures of life that include our sexuality. But what most of us do is that we are we step away from our responsibility in creating that and pressure the other person to make us feel safe or to make us feel secure. And we actually interfere with creating it. That's so good. It's because I do notice like when Adam comes in after work and he sits there, I call it pillow talk and mm -hmm. he sits in to, and we're just talking and laughing and connecting. Mm -hmm. I always want to have sex with him. Always. Yeah. Right. Because I feel that intimacy and it's not even like sexual. It's just we're connecting. And so that yeah. I tell him like, that's my biggest turn on. It's just like connecting with you and talking to you and laughing and like being, you know, having that intimacy. So like, what would you say? You said people don't put in the work to create that intimacy. What no. would you say is that work? That it's like safer in a way to do it the way that Again, I think you're both ambivalent in the true sense that you're kind of vacillating between two different positions. It's safer to say, I need 10 minutes. Okay, that's a safer position than I'm a guy. I'm only asking for 10 minutes. I, I helped you with the dishes. I was out working all day today. Uh, it's a safer position to kind of be annoyed that you're not getting the, the 10 minutes you're entitled to than it is to be in a more exposed position than that to say, you know, it's hard because I feel rejected or to say, I really desire you or you really matter to me. You know, it's easier to kind of go into a transactional position. Mm -hmm. It's easier to say, I want emotional connection than it is to sort of own what you as a woman want sexually and to stand up for a sexual relationship that really accommodates you as well as him. So there's, uh, th that's just two versions of the ways that we can often take safer, less exposed positions than, you know, like it's safer to say, I'm going to accommodate my husband, I roll, you know, than it is to really step into an intimate relationship, step into a sexual relationship and let your sexuality and your desires show up. So a lot of us would rather think that husbands are boorish men to be managed than to really step in and create something that is satisfying for two. It's easier for men to feel resentful that they don't get the sex that they thought they were going to get than to really think about how desirably they function, whether or not they're really invested in their partner, whether or not they have anxieties about being knowable. Because if you're just in an entitled position, it's easy to hide behind that than to really think be more exposed in your marriage, be more invested in your marriage. So that is so crazy. You say that because when Adam's vulnerable with me, mm -hmm. I'm like, 
I just, I feel so connected. So yeah. that is, that's so true. Yeah. So I guess, so from a, from a male perspective, yeah. that doesn't come easy sure. um, to be like always emotionally connected. Like to me, I love Brie, yeah. but that's a lot of work. Yeah, sure. Uh, like to be always on. Yeah. And yeah. Well, so I don't, like, that's, let me say, yeah. Adam, I'm not somebody who thinks men should be like women. <laughs> okay. Like yeah. I don't think, I think women are as a group more emotionally aware, more attuned to what it is going on. It's, it's part of keeping babies and children alive. We're good at it, not to brag, mm. but we're good. At it. Okay. And right. I don't think that men have to become conversant in the emotional language that a lot of women enjoy. I mean, I'm personally married to a very introverted guy who doesn't speak. It doesn't, it doesn't converse in that realm easily. He's like, mm-hmm. you know, he's a, he's an engineer. So I think that, um, that's not the goal of intimacy because a lot of times people confuse intimacy with, I feel this, I feel that. And I don't, I think that is a part of intimacy and I'm certainly not dissing it, but there's a lot of ways to express It's like, how knowable are you? That's the real thing. Mm-hmm. And how invested are you in your partner? Like my husband's not very verbal, but he really knows me mm-hmm. and he really listens to me and he's very invested in my well being, And that's what matters. And, yeah. you know, so you know, and I think we, we are unfair in our treatment of sexuality often because sexuality is a way to care for someone. It's a way to love and know someone. And so it doesn't all have to happen through language or doing dishes. Those aren't unimportant things, but there's a lot of ways to demonstrate, uh, to manifest your investment and love. Um, Another so here would be here. Here's a question because I do get this once, and this is totally uh, from the perspective of the male. But a lot of the males are like, "Hey, listen, like I tr- like uh, I have tried to be uh, emotionally connected, or I've tried to um, do the small things, and her libido is not changing, uh-huh. and it's still, you know, uh, it's still a work for her, and it's still a sort. So, uh, you know, what what do you say to? And this could be on both sides of it. What do you say to the to a partner who's saying, Hey, I'm putting in more than the other. Uh-huh. And I still have, I still have like, especially as a man, like I still have physical needs. Like, even though, yes, I want to be intimate, but I also just want sex too. I mean, it, it, like there's a balance there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, y- yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I think again, I would not put it in the frame of needs because if it, if it was about s- sexual needs, that anything that's a need, if you don't get it, you'll die. Okay. So in, in the sense of like sex drive is not the right way to say it because a drive is anything a human being needs to survive. And if maybe a desire, sure. It's a desire. It's part of living a good life. It's part of thriving. So I'm not discounting it, but as soon as you put it in need, you basically are saying I have a need and you're the only one who can gratify it. Mm -hmm. And as, and as soon as you make that true, you are basically again, reinforcing a meaning that you need to service me because I can't handle this on my own, but we can all handle our sexuality on our own and survive. Okay. That's not to say that we might be thriving or that we're having the relationship we want. But again, I'm just trying to reinforce this because it's so countercultural that if Mm. you approach sex, like it's that your spouse is the only one who can gratify the need, you will keep it in the frame of transactionality. Mm Mm-hmm. Rather than, no, if I'd never gotten married, I would figure out a way to manage my sexuality and still have my self-respect intact. It's not my wife's job. Okay. Now that's different than do I want an intimate marriage and do I want a sexually alive marriage? And am I acting in a way that actually would create that or make that possible? Because a lot of people want a sexually alive marriage, but when they don't have a partner rushing towards them, admiring everything they do, they're resentful and short and meaning they're actively undermining any chance of having it. Mm -hmm. So they, they want it, but they want it to be offered to them rather than they want to take responsibility for creating it. 
to kind of justify their resentment. That's right. And they, they, they function very undesirably, but then they say, well, it's my partner's fault because she doesn't desire me. You know, mm-hmm. like one person I was working with, he would resent that his wife wouldn't get excited when he'd come home at the end of the day, that she was busy with the kids, cleaning the kitchen, whatever. And so I asked him, well, well, how do you come into the, how, how are you doing it? And he would come in, you know, resentment dripping off him, go up to his study, you know, she'd come in and say, Hey, how are you doing? Do you want to come down for dinner? And his resentment was just thick, right? So he was actively, I mean, he was resentful that she wasn't jumping up and down, but he's a tough guy to jump up and down for because yeah. he's not acting like somebody, he's acting like right. somebody that hates you and wants you to get your act together. That's hard to get right. excited about. So I, my point is that we are often creating and, and part and parcel to the resentful relational reality that we don't like. But back to your point, Adam, like a little bit what I hear in that look, I'm washing lots of dishes now, or I'm doing these things and she still has low libido. So I have two ideas about that. One is that if you're doing these things because you want to flip the switch or get the thing, uh, you know, get the sex out of your wife, it, it's still at a, it's at a lower meaning frame than the husband in this case could operate at. The question is, are you interested in a intimate partnership? Are you invested in your wife because you care about her and you also want a good sexual relationship? Well, I would say stand up for both. Do the things that are a manifestation of caring about her, being invested in her life, and don't shy away from the fact that you want a robust sexual relationship. You can't make her do it but you're not pretending otherwise or apologizing for the fact that you want this thing, want a good part of your relationship to, to thrive an important part of the relationship to thrive, standing up for a good sexual relationship. And I don't mean just being upset that you don't have it. I mean, doing your part to create it is a good thing in a marriage. And to say that it matters is a good thing in a marriage. Uh, Your spouse may B, let's just do it in the stereotypical way of the man being the higher desire. Let's say she's still not, her libido's not kicking in. Well, then the question might be, why isn't it? Is it that, you know, some people would, are afraid to be that exposed in a marriage. And so they use the idea that my husband doesn't care to to justify it. And then if he starts to care more and really be better, they may still be afraid to step in and may still want to kind of hold on to the old reasons or try to. Um, It could be that they are so accustomed to being in a self-abnegating position that it's very unfamiliar, even if their spouse is genuinely making room for them to thrive. But there still may be growth that is really their decision to make, and you can't make somebody make that decision. So maybe they need to do your online course. Yeah, Yeah, figure it out, right? I feel like there's so many tools that we just don't know. Even you speaking, I've just heard so many truth bombs Mm -hmm. that have opened my eyes. I feel like, man, maybe we all need therapy. (laughs) Maybe we all need help help because we are so blind to ourselves. I mean, there's nothing unusual about the two of you. Right? We are. We how to say it we operate within meanings that we don't even know exist or that are limiting us. And oftentimes we can't see it until somebody else points it out to us. Or like you're saying with the online course, you know, the the one I think you're referring to is the art of desire course, which is a course for women to really understand how they have often learned to operate in a self denying way in their relationships, in relationship to their sexuality. So they may have the husband of the year, but their relationship to themselves and their own desires, they haven't yet seen or woken up sufficiently to the fact that their spouse may respect them, but they haven't yet learned to respect themselves enough to take up an equal position in the marriage. And so, um, you know, the, the hard thing about marriage is you can't control the other person, although many of us try. <laughs> uh, right. you, know, you, you only can control who you are. And that's a really hard thing about marriage 
but it's also exactly the reality that pressures us to grow ourselves up in marriage. And the more you grow yourself up, the more you put a positive pressure on your spouse to deal with her or himself. But conversely, it's easy to also use the limitations of your spouse to justify your limitations and not grow yourself up. Yes. And I wanted to like going back a little to what you said about investing. I, um, I know like when I talk with my friends and Adam talks with his friends, it's so funny. It's all the same stuff. Yeah. We're all like, we all feel the same and think the same. And so it's just funny. Like I remember, like I, I tell Adam, like, if I sometimes I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to cuddle because I know you just want sex. Mm-hmm. Like you don't actually just want to cuddle me. You, and I know it'll just lead to sex, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I hope. And, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, I'm like, well, maybe if we cuddled more without the sex, I would know like, oh, he does actually just want to connect with me and not have. Which is why I say we should just cuddle after sex. it's not the same tell him jennifer (laughs) well i mean i think that's absolutely true when people i mean there's sort of two sides of this which is that um a lot of times the just the, the the affection drops out of marriages because how to say it people make it so that if there's any touching, it's either sex or, or yes. if there's any touching, it goes to sex. Yes. And so therefore you, if you don't want it to go to sex, you really limit the touching. And yes. But if people really um, getting more conversant in their physicality to be able to really be with each other without it being necessarily in the form of sex, meaning it's, it's a way of loving and being connected that can go anywhere from just, you know, a touch of someone's back as you walk by, touch of your spouse's back as you walk by, mm-hmm. to, to meaningful sex. And that, you know, I think a lot of times um, what's going on is on the lower desire person side of it, they don't feel like they can say no. So right. it's almost like if I say yes to anything, I have to say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that meaning becomes true in the marriage, there's going to be a lot more avoidance of anything. Right. Because, you- yeah, I- which is true. Cause I, like, I almost feel like Bree, Bree's always suspect of my motives. So if I ever do anything nice, she goes, what do you want? You know, it's like, no, if, if he like comes up and he's kissing me and then he starts like really making out with me, I'm like, Oh, he wants sex right now. And I have to go to this appointment and, you know, so yeah. I can't just enjoy it. I can't just be like, oh, he's he's making out with me because he loves me. It's because I know he wants sex. Yeah. So that is really true. That's Yeah, really true. and then that's a function of your you two operating out of a need fulfillment frame. Yes. Rather than an intimacy yeah. frame. That is I'm gonna like change how I look at it now. I've never even thought of it that way. Because I think if you were both thinking of it more in terms of, I love Brie. She's really attractive to me right now. I'm not going to kiss her because I'm hoping to have sex. I mean, I wouldn't mind having sex, of course, especially if it goes in that direction. But how about I just be with her in the way I'm with her right now? That I just touch her like I see how beautiful she is. And I touch her like, I express that in the way I touch her. Well, First of all, she's going to track it as more of an intimate move rather than a uh, pressuring move. He has an agenda. He's in step one of his agenda. How do I make this agenda? How do I foil it? How do I keep it from happening? <laughs> <laughs> all my tricks are like yeah. exposed at this so point. That's true because years. the thing is in marriage, people track each other so well. Yeah. I have no tricks left. Yeah, exactly. There's no real <laughs> tricks. You know, it's like, oh great, here we go. How are we? You know what? Sure. I've got this and this and this, and, and I and I feel, you know, and I'm tired. And so people get really good at coming up with all the roadblocks. Yeah. Because they want to block the agenda. But I have if a headache. The agenda yeah. is, if, if the agenda is I like you and you're yeah. attractive to me. And um and you know. Touching you f- is 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 meaningful to me. Well, people can track that too. And I mean, 
Brianna, you might be suspicious, like, wait a minute, that it feels different, but is it different? And is, is he just getting more sophisticated in his trickery or is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, if he came up and just made out with me and then left, I would be like, oh, what? Yeah. Well, first of all, <laughs> more desirable because you'd feel bro- both cherished and sort of, yes. but also some mystery in it. And yeah, that's like, true. it's not just there for the taking when I want him. He, he went away and why, and where is he? And, and, you know, yeah. it's like, a, it's, I think, you know, I listened to an older woman once and I don't even know who she is or where I heard it, but she said, you know, something like, my husband and I made love every night of our marriage. Sometimes we had intercourse. Mm. Oh, yeah. There was a way of being with each other that was a, it was a form of love and making love through the phys- through their physicality, right? That's about attention and care and desire mm-hmm. that doesn't have to necessarily get expressed in an orgasm. Yes. And this is a good, for me, this is a really good frame to think through because Brie goes and talks to her friends yeah. and that, and that truth that her truth continues to be. I know you guys need to stop talking yeah. to your friends. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it's, and, then, and then I go talk to my friends and it's only justifying what I'm already thinking. Like, yes. yeah, see guys, I'm only asking for 10 minutes. Like, <laughs> right. it's like, and they're all like, yeah, yeah, man. yeah, man. And then, and it's funny because, um, because then I will start to hear, we all now start to hear the same, uh, same. like points. Yep. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh, my friend's wife just said this. And then yeah. come to find out my friend's wife was just talking to Bree. <laughs> so, it's like, so now they like get together. And especially after like, if they all have a dinner together, they oh, all go yeah, to dinner. Terrible. I will always like the next day be like, all right, guys, let's hear it. What'd you hear? <laughs> and it is verbatim of the discussion and i'm like okay well so now it's almost like so this is really good for me because we can relate to each other but having yeah yeah, having a professional be like no this is the actual frame you're looking at now we can be like oh yeah well you it's well the thing is too is that you're building your intimacy with your friends not with each other so that is you go to your friends because with one another you get reinforcement can you see what I have to put up with? And you're like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You know, it's it's like, so it's easy to come out of your friend dinners feeling justified, feeling mm-hmm. like you're the one who's got it bad in the marriage. And who doesn't like to feel that way? <laughs> right. Which is funny because every time Brie comes back from their dinner, she's like, oh, I just love it. It just, I feel so connected with my friends. I'm like, <laughs> Now I know why, because she's not getting it at home, you know? (laughs) Exactly. And I will say, like, Adam honestly is such a good husband. He really is. He makes me feel so loved. He's always making me feel so beautiful. He's very attentive to my needs. Like, he's an amazing husband. And I would say overall, we have a great relationship. And I would, like, I'm even happy with our sexual relationship. But what you're saying, I'm like, oh, it could be great. Yeah, Like, it could be so much better with even just the tools that you've given us just in this little bit. Like it's making me really excited. Like, yeah, great. Because yeah. It's really, I mean, like friends are awesome, but you want your friends to push you to be your better, more courageous self. That's the best way a friend can be a friend to you is help you see your blind spots. And it's easy with friends to get reinforcement rather than I'm being dumb here. Or I'm being fair here. And so, you know, because there's something really refining about the process of male and female, masculine and feminine energy to be kind of pushed up against each other because it refines, you know, it, um, it helps you each be better if you let it. But if you diffuse that pressure by getting reinforcement through people that are like you, you actually interfere with an important process that is inherent to creating an intimate marriage. Right. Um, I want, I wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier, because I feel like it's almost like a, it's own pandemic as far as um, the correlation between uh, your self uh, love or your confidence yeah. and your relationship, which it seems to me that uh, once again, back to this, even with um, males, yeah. it seems like, uh, no matter what success, it just still, still seems like we battle a lot with our self-confidence and especially yep. 
in ironically like the Instagram world where I feel like a lot of wives are now uh, or women in general are also dealing with a really big hit on comparison and self-confidence. And so it seems like it's like a really bad mix for intimacy when you have one or both spouses that have very low confidence and maybe outwardly it doesn't seem that way. So what's kind of like your top two or three things well, I, I absolutely agree with you because, you know, we all say we want an intimate marriage, but very few of us actually want an intimate marriage because what the meaning of intimacy is, I'm really willing to let you know me like from Vul- all, like yes. it, insecurities and all immaturities and all everything which, annoying about me. You can know it. Like who wants that? <laughs> which, which, And I'll say really quick, it yeah. took me like the first five, six years. Like there was so many things that I just, my true thoughts and true feelings. Like I was not vulnerable till Brie yeah. about, you know, Hey, I, you know, depression or anxiety yeah. that I had, like, because I was just so like, I have to be the man here and, and I have to fulfill this role it. and and so, and I'm just deal with it. And so, um, yeah. exactly. So yeah. It took me a long time to, gain some confidence and that was kind of a whole different thing for me but absolutely so i guess so what would what would you say is okay well well just maybe keep going on that line of way yeah so that. so i think right so that and i agree with you adam this idea like i think men are given such a demanding frame for demonstrating or establishing their masculinity it's like invulnerable you know that you are kind of pretend strong and You can't show, and sex is one way to be vulnerable, but men are given a very limited ways to expose the underbelly or to share in the inherent vulnerability of living in an uncertain world. I mean, none of us escape that. And so, Mm -hmm. and none of us escape limitation. We all have limitations. So the way to confidence is kind of twofold. Meaningful confidence can't come through pretending. And Instagram's full of pretending, right? It's like, you know, the best pictures. I mean, I posted a picture of my mom last night on my personal one because she turned 88 years old and it's a beautiful picture of her. But, you know, of course, the one where she was chewing, I didn't stick that one up there. I put the last one yeah. there. <laughs> So it would imply that my mom always looks phenomenal. <laughs> right. But she kind of does because she's great and I love her, but... But, you know, I'm just saying, you know, it, right. that's what we that's what we do. We curate the picture of what we show of ourselves. And so it's a false world. And and so I think that, you know, you can't create confidence out of pretense. And you create confidence out of two things, being courageous enough to know who you are and who you aren't yet. Flaws and all like I'm willing to take an honest look. And not be running from myself or trying to keep myself from being known to others. The more you can let, the more you can know who you are, limitations and all, and let others know you, the less you're going to be running scared. The less you're going to have to pretend. The less you're going to make intimacy about just sex, for example, or just conversation, because you feel freer to let somebody in on who you are. And so that's a critical, critical piece to being happy because if you can't be okay with yourself as a flawed human being in development, as we all are, you're going to never be free. You're going to never let somebody in, even though we all long for it. The second way to build confidence is to, you know, it's, it's inherently based in an honest self-assessment and then that you are in development, that you are confronting your limitations you're taking them on. You're stretching yourself to be better, to live up to your higher expectations of yourself. And I don't mean perfectionistic ones. I mean, like, I know I'm not being fair to my wife, or I'm not being fair to my husband, or I know I'm hiding in my victimhood. I need to stop doing that. I got to be better at that. When you take yourself on in those ways, you, you create a meaningful confidence because you see yourself being able to living in a way that you genuinely respect more that creates more respect in others because it's respect worthy behavior. And you see yourself as someone who's able to, how to say it, like master the world that you live in on some level. And so that creates a meaningful confidence 
a lot of people go for the pretend confidence of looking like an ideal or bullying to look like they're strong. You know, a lot of us look for fake versions of confidence that, that come through dominating or presenting a facade of perfection, but isn't a, a real confidence because it's the people that feel comfortable with who they are that really win the prize. They're the ones that can be at peace and be in their own skin, in their marriage, with their children, with their friends, and they are able to be at peace in the world. Which is, I mean, that's such the harder route to go. Mm -hmm. That's a hard thing to do for her. Putting a lot more yeah. work in. It and I love how... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I interrupted you. Well, what it's you just say? developmental. There's nothing how to say it. It's not like the good people are born that way. Nobody's born that way. You have to mm -hmm. develop it. It comes through living honestly. It comes through having courage. It comes through subjecting yourself to the things that you are not yet competent in. You know, men, we don't give us... Women, it's, it's like more okay to fail because... You know, it's okay to be vulnerable and be female. For men, it's almost like don't do not do it if you're not sure you can't be good at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's – but to really develop confidence and mastery is to subject yourselves to the things you're not yet good at. And that takes a kind of courage. And it's, a, it's, it's part of our development as human beings. And so having compassion towards ourselves in that process is also really important. And I love how you said in one of your podcasts that like uh, to have a strong marriage and have even better intimacy as you to be independently happy, mm -hmm. like not rely on your partner yes. for your happiness. Yes, that's right. And I feel like that that is exact thing happened to me. Like after I had the baby, I just was not, I was, I'm my third, my mm -hmm. other wasn't too bad, but the third baby, I don't know what happened, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I was messed up, mm -hmm. but I just was not confident in myself. I really wasn't happy. I was stressed. I was, had super low self-esteem mm -hmm. and it definitely like bled through into our marriage because I was mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, oh my gosh, I'm just not happy. I just don't, I just can't. And poor Adam, you know, he's like, what is wrong with you? But then once I figured out how to make myself happy and not rely on Adam to do it, then I felt like our relationship got so much stronger and so much better yeah. through it. So, well, in a motherhood like can kind of wreak havoc because, well, two reasons. Um, one is that I think we have, and it can wreak havoc on our sexuality too, because I think there is an ideal out there that like the good mothers are selfless. That is that they sort of subjugate their self-interest, they subjugate their development uh, for the benefit of their offspring. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also, so there's that idealism, but then there's also the reality, especially when you have really young children like you do, Brie, there is a kind of suppression of self that's important. Like that is to say, it doesn't matter if you don't want to get up at 2 a.m. For the survival of your child, you need to get up at 2 a.m. And, so, right. and so there is a kind of like that you're for at least a period of time, the things that matter to you outside of nurturing and caregiving are, are put aside. And so it's, it's easy to kind of lose track of yourself in that pressure. Yes. And I don't mean that every woman responds the same way. Some women feel more the most alive they've ever felt when they have really young children. But I think for a lot of people, there is a kind of, um, well, and then there's also in young parenting, there's very few measures or markers of success or achievement. It's like day after day doing the same yeah. thing <laughs> over and over and over again. It's thankless work. You know, yeah. it looks it's not impressive from the outside. I remember going to some of my husband's work parties because I was home with my kids in their early stages. And I remember feeling like I had a PhD. Nobody really knew that. But I remember feeling like I was getting treated kind of less than by people right. who didn't know me. And, and you know, just kind of having to manage that condescension was, was not fun. 
So I think that, so there's a lot of different, you know, that we both value mothering, but devalue it culturally. Sorry about the dog down there. Um, (laughs) uh, That there's also a lot of the the actual reality of parenting a young child will suppress a lot of our interests and so on. Uh, But I think that the more you can hold on to your sense of choice and all that, that this is what I want to be doing right now, that I can hold on to the value of what I'm doing right now for its benefit to these young people. And that it's temporary, meaning that there are aspects of myself that I will still develop, that I will belong to in time. And um, that can help in, in kind of keeping an anchor into your core self. You know, right. so, you know, a lot of times people think, Oh, I have to be home. I don't really have a choice. You know, that's going to really, kind of wreak havoc on your sense of self if it's like no this is not easy at times but it's what I really do choose and I know what I'm doing is meaningful and important even though it can be thankless sometimes you know it's 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 a you know Brie you're saying your own happiness yes and also sustaining your own sense of self and the reality of your equality in the marriage Mm -hmm. that's also very important to hold within yourself and if somebody's struggling to hold their own equality, then figuring out what do I need to sort through to be in a more self-respecting position? Because yes. we want to, that respect to come from our partner, but we haven't yet worked it out within ourselves. And yes. That's an important thing to work out within ourselves. Yes. I think once I started my business, I was like, oh, like I found my calling. Like this yeah. is what I you know, anyway, and it it helped so much because I wasn't looking for that validation from Adam or from anywhere else. Like that really helped to pull me out. And I I have one more question for you before I let you go, because I really like how you uh, were talking about choosing. Like we always have a choice. And I listened to one of your podcasts where you're talking about how to choose your spouse Mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And I loved how you said, um, you don't, you're not stuck with them forever. Like Mm -hmm. how you said when you got married and you Mm -hmm. were like, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. But you know, and you took the pressure off. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little more about that? I love how you said like, you can get a divorce if you want to get a divorce, but you're choosing to stay with your husband. And when it's a choice, sorry, I'm, you you yeah. explained it. It was so good. Sure, sure. Well, I was talking to a friend um, a couple of days ago, and I was just explaining sort of that same idea that, you know, a couple of days before the ceremony, I was freaking out a little bit like, oh my goodness, like I'm making kind of the last choice of my life, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I feared so much that marriage was ultimately a prison um, and, you know, had been part of my ambivalence about getting married. But I, I sort of settled myself down and I just said, you know, I feel good about this choice. I know John well. I, I, it's clear to me that this is a sound choice. I, meaning I wasn't saying it is a, risk-free choice. I didn't know that I had, you know, that there was no chance of being unhappy, but I felt that I was, I had made a solid choice. And then I just said to myself, it's not my last choice. Like that I, if John were to ever become unworthy of that choice, I can choose otherwise. And so it wasn't like flippant. It could sound flippant on this. Like, ah, oh, if I if I get tired of this, I'm out. You know, yeah. <laughs> like at least for myself, I was like, I take my choice seriously. Yeah. Which is not like I have to be here, but I'm not being flippant about inviting this person into my life. Yeah. On the other hand, if he's not living up to the to that choice, or if it becomes undermining of me and my integrity to stay in that choice then I will choose otherwise as painful as that may be as much as there may be losses. And, you know, the friend I was talking to, she said, you know, I didn't believe I had a choice. I believed I'd gotten married in the temple and now it was, it was like, it was a done deal. Yeah. Right away in the marriage when there were issues, she kind of felt like she couldn't speak up about it because she, she needed to be okay with it. She needed to be happy with it. Like she was stuck. Exactly. And so then it created more and more and more of a feeling of being stuck. 
where I think for me, I was more like, I've made a choice. I choose you. I want to bring the best to you. But that the way to be happy is to create a a two person marriage where we can both thrive. So I will bring my best to you, but I will also talk about the things that aren't working for me. And that inherent friction is refining because the goal is not, I want to dominate and I want to have everything I want. The goal is about creating a home for two. Right. But that's based in choosing not prison. You can get married out of choice or married out of a model, a prison model. And the choice one works out much better. Which once you, I mean, so once you flip on that concept of, okay, um, right. Cause it's like for eternity, I'm in this, I'm trapped. So I just have to bear it until, but what you're saying is a lot of times, even the concept of, Hey, Hey, I I can leave this if I want, but I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay because I choose to be here. Mm -hmm. Then the mentality now is very different because, because why, why does that change? it? It allows you to assert yourself. I mean, we, one of the people that I have followed closely is the work of, of Dr. David Schnarch. And one of the things that he says is we want to belong. We want to belong to ourselves and we want to belong to one another. We want both of those things. But a lot of times women especially have been taught to belong to others is more important than belonging to yourself. The problem is if you don't feel you belong to yourself, you will shrivel into obscurity. You won't want to have sex. You won't have a light within you. And, and so when we've been given ideals that are about this sort of self debasement, it it doesn't work well. So I was home with my children and my oldest child uh, was on the autism spectrum. My husband was traveling a lot at first and it was challenging. And I'd also turned down a very, uh, like a, like a, a, a high status job to be home. And so I, the thing is it was intense and hard. Okay. And there were times where I was going to the grocery store. I would have two screaming children the whole time. <laughs> and I was doing my best, but like, you know, my child with autism just was overwhelmed in the grocery store. So I, but the thing that I would often do for myself is I would kind of sit down and remind myself, I have choices. I could turn this over to someone else. I could go take a job. I could, I could, We could hire someone to do this. And then I would come back to, I don't want to do that. As hard as this is, of all my choices, this is the choice that I ultimately want, even though it's not easy. And that helped me not get depressed during a pretty oppressive time. I mean, you know, in terms of belonging to my other interests, very little time for it. I mean, getting a shower was a challenge. And so it was a way of asserting my selfhood even though it was a decision to let go of some of my other desires for now. So it's sacrificing, but it's not, it's a kind of sacrifice that you assert your integrity into. And so you belong to yourself, even in the difficulty. Like I choose my husband, but it's a choice. I don't have to love this person, but I have a responsibility to myself, to my integrity that I want to love this person well. That was the promise I made to God. It wasn't to him. It was to myself and God about the kind of person I would be in the marriage to him. So I have to stop being an idiot and immature and go <laughs> and do the better thing right now. You know, right. I've had that conversation with myself. And that's that's important because then you're maybe doing the harder thing or you're going and saying, hey, I'm sorry. I know I'm not being fair. But you're belonging to yourself at the same time because you're belonging to your integrity in that process. Man, that is really good. That is so good. That is you're really, so good, really Jennifer. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question before we go because I know I'm taking all of your time, but I didn't get to ask. I wanted to just do one question from my followers because it was the most asked question. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever gotten asked this, but the question was, how often should you have sex with your spouse? (sighs) Yeah. Do you get that a lot? I do, but it's a terrible question. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. I was like, I feel like that's so individual. I don't even know how you'd be able to answer that. If I were to say, okay, three times a week. I don't know that that solves anything for anybody because right. if you're operating from this frame of duty, like, well, I'm supposed to, and you put out three times a week. I don't think that's going to help the marriage. If it's like, well, Jennifer Finlayson Fife said we should have it three times. So you better 
you know, pony up and let's do it. I right. don't think that helps the marriage. I, I mean, I think that what helps a marriage is two people honestly creating a home for two in the sexual realm and being willing to look at yourself in that. What makes having sex with me undesirable? Why do you want to have it only once a week? Why do you I want to have that. it seven times? <laughs> okay, like, yeah, like, like can I in. can I just try to know you better around this? And what is it that what does it do for you? Why do you like it so much? Why don't you like it? What's hard yeah. about it for you? Because if people would start taking it maybe less personally and less like there's something they're supposed to do as opposed to can we create a sexual friendship, like a real friendship? Can we, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning, a client, you know, it's like, you know, you keep prioritizing control over intimacy. You want too much for it to go the way that makes you feel invulnerable as opposed to something shared. And so, you know, can we really create something that's about friendship and partnership because that's the couple that's going to start having a lot more sex because it's a it's a it's an enjoyable place to go. Yes. Nurturing place to go. When you trust that your sexual relationship sustains you is a source of nurturance and and fun. Well, you may be tired because you got the kids and everything, but you want to get there because it's a way right. to have rejuvenation. It's if it's enjoyable. about oh, I got to take I've taken care of three kids, now I got to take care of you. I mean, no, you're going to figure out quickly. I had a, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Right. Well, you're going to figure out quickly how to get out of that because you don't want a fourth kid to take care of at the end of the day. So, you know, it's like, so you, you gotta, you've got to address that meaning frame or else it will always be that the way then that the tired wife and mother belongs to herself is to not have sex. Right. And if... The, for the husband, his sense of belonging to his own, you know, self is to feel desired. He's going to always be kind of trying to get the sex that makes him feel in control and makes him feel desired rather than stepping back and looking at how am I participated in a, a dynamic of pursuit, pers- sorry, I can't say it, pursuit and resistance that's not working well for either of us. Man, Jennifer, you are so wise. Thank you. This I'm going to have to re-listen to this. I like, know. Four more times. And you're going to have this to share it. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to share it with both of our friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're we not having dinner right. anymore, people. <laughs> you know, so we can all be on the right track now. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful for you coming. I know like all this, this whole thing just made me want to go do, you said it's the art of desire is mm-hmm. your online course. Yes. And then that's what I want to do with that as well. So there's, well, I also am doing a men's sexuality course this fall. It's called the art of loving. And then I also have two couples courses that are for couples to take together. One that focuses on your relationship and the dynamics in the relationship that are undermining intimacy, just emotional intimacy and friendship and freedom in the couple. And then a sexual enhancing sexual intimacy course. That's about deepening addressing sexual problems in the dynamic, but also deepening and expanding and making the sexual relationship more alive and, and, uh, fun. So Ooh, let's do that one. Man, too. We babe. got, a, we got some work. We got a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? This just made me so excited. Like yeah. I just was like, it's a fun, it's a fun thing. And I really want to be good at this. I really yeah. want to thrive. Yeah. You know, I really want this to be like a very strong point in our marriage and thrive in it. And I'm yeah. invested in it. I know Adam's very invested in I'll it. I'll do anything. <laughs> so, well, it's well, so well it worth it. The work is worth it. You know, my, I become an empty nester of sorts. Uh, we've become empty nesters just in the last few weeks. Um, and uh, somewhat unexpectedly, because my youngest got into a musical boarding school and we decided with COVID to send her for high school. And so it wasn't expected and a little bit sad, but here we are. But, you know, the work we've done to really have a good friendship, it's all there. And so it's like, you know, how to say it with the, when the kids aren't there, you really have to face your relationship. And so yeah. to really have a friend and partner. And if we, I have to be trapped in a house because of COVID, I, I can't think of a better person to be trapped with. <laughs> so that's, right. that's so awesome. It's great. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. We appreciate you so much. And where can people find you? 
just go to my website, which is finlayson-fife. That's my last name, finlaysonfife.com. And you can find the podcast archive, all the courses that I teach, live workshops that I hope to be doing sometime next year again, and yes. all the other resources there. So Perfect. And um, you also have an Instagram if they want to follow great. you on Instagram. Yep, Instagram and Facebook. And, oh, we also have a Facebook group. Uh, called oh, Ask, Ask an LDS Marriage and Rela- Relationship Therapist. And so there's a lot of resources there where I do Facebook Lives on different topics and answer people's awesome. questions. Awesome. That's so great. And we will put all the links to everything in the show notes for you guys. So thank you so much for coming, Jennifer. We're so grateful. Thank you. Have such a Bye. great day. Thanks so much, you just, guys. You just saved our marriage. <laughs> <laughs>